What's up, everyone? Welcome down to the vault and forever after. You can hear the laughter. The world's being plastered by an evil bastard. Exterminating faster, devastating plaster. Fabulous, Fabulous disaster. disaster. We are going to talk about the making of Fabulous Disaster today. I'm glad I was there to see part of it. You you were there for because you were there for the uh, album cover shoot and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, so but that was separate kind of, kind of right. That's you were kind of because you, and you were there on the tour. So I got, I got a little part I can so talk there about. Is, there 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 is some stuff there. Oh, yeah. which um actually, a lot of you have seen um um you know the Birmingham episode. This was in that same summer period. That was we had went to Europe and we ended up over there. But when we came back. You we had to do some work. We actually, no, we actually took a couple of weeks off. We did, I think, was a two weeks to a month off. Back in those days, we were young. We didn't know anything better but just to keep going, writing songs. It's not as we well, are older I think it was now. the time period, too. People weren't, like, waiting so long. Actually, records paid back then. Yeah, well, right. it was. Yeah, it made, made sense to keep doing them. So, so it was uh, summer of 88, and um, we had taken some time off. I'd probably say... It was probably July or August when we started, and we recorded. We actually wrote this really, really, really quick. I would say the basic album was written between within six to eight weeks. And I think Gary and Rick, you know, through uh, going on tour, had had um, other riffs. You know, they always have riffs, but we didn't have really songs. Uh, the only and they song. produced it, both of them with no, Mark not necessarily. They did a little bit, they, but yeah. they but, I mean, they it was called still, him a producer. On. It was still more, you know, Mark in there. Mark knew, you know, we're still driving. I guess every Exodus record is really produced by you know Exodus because they're Gary's always been very very hands on and and um and and the members not as much been. as Eminem because the next one they really well yeah did they, they, they they but we'll we'll get into yeah. the next one let's. <laughs> This one, they were still kind of getting their chops down with that, you know, and still as songwriters. And, you know, for me, it was my second record that I'm doing with the band. And and uh, this one, like I said, we started writing in 88. We had a studio, I remember, <clears throat> right on San Pablo Avenue in Oakland. That was it was a, like a storefront. The Kentucky like, Fried Chicken across the street. Was like, that what it was? Because yeah. I remember <laughs> that, but it could have been like a business. But for some reason, I think it was an actual printing business. But the guy didn't run like a shop out of it, and we were set up right in the front where you would have like your store. That's a rough part. You of know town, what I mean? Right? It was in the day though. We went there, and we kind of went there like a job. We actually went there for um, from like eleven in the morning to like five o'clock in the afternoon. We we went and we actually hammered most of the record out, and we really didn't have anything um, um, yet. The only one we did have was corruption the song corruption we were going to capitol records at some point which we knew and they had uh, were releasing the soundtrack for decline of the western civilization part two the metal years and even though we weren't in the movie they wanted to add a song to it and somehow uh, it was the first time we ever did this before either we we actually went and wrote a song on the road and recorded it on the road. I can't even remember where we recorded it. Somewhere back in the south or back unusual. east. And we really don't do that. We did that on 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 uh, uh, the Pledges of the Flesh tour. Uh, and and uh, I can't remember where we did that at. And then, um, uh, but we have basically had nothing for that album. So we, we hit it hard. I mean, we hit it like went there every single day and kind of and i mean even going into the studio i was still like writing lyrics gary and i were still putting finishing touches you know and trying to you know label you know songs and name songs and stuff and we were coming up with ideas and stuff and it, it kind of happened really quick we worked with the same guy that did pledges of the flesh mark senesak a very competent good well guy. we found out he was yeah. we found he was we we liked what, what we got from pleasures so you know we were not gonna um screw with that at, at all and uh and we recorded at the same place we went to alpha and omega studios in san francisco my hometown in uh, another rough part of town uh, in well, the yeah. tenderloin that's but you know that's where you get your best stuff you know what i mean it's not all pamsy cushy you know studio you need the you need to yeah, have the studio's that. nice but you know you walk outside just another world besides we had a good relationship with uh sandy perlman 
who had owned the studio and worked with so many artists. He'd, you know, done, you know, Blue Oyster Cold forever and, you know, so many things. We, 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 it just seemed right. We didn't want to have to try to reinvent the wheel at this point. We, it, and that's back when you had the big board and you needed to go to a place. There was none of this home or studio recording. Well, there was no Pro Tools back then, no computers. It was to the board and, you know, to reels. The budget I mean, and everything. No, yeah. And the time period set up that you have to have it done in a certain amount of time. So we went in and uh, I believe we were done by... We probably went in in August or September. We were done I, around October, I think, and because the, the, the the album came out in January of eighty nine, January thirtieth, yeah, of eighty nine. So I know it was done in, in the fall. All the mixing, and mastering. Yeah, I popped in and out of there, and what I remember is hearing pieces of songs and uh, certain parts. You know, whenever I'd pop in, somebody was doing something. But what really sticks in my mind, and I know this is the last song I think on the album, is Open Season. And I happened to be there when Steve was doing the vocals to it. And I can remember because this is, uh, you know, you see Steve recording his vocals. And that's not the easiest song, right? Well, um, I mean, it was, it was one that we had to write in the studio. And those songs are the hardest ones because you're not feeling them necessarily yet you're reading them off paper i don't so like that to prepare was, uh, myself in like the that. other in, in the other room and i was behind gary and gary was sitting there with this piece of paper and the lyrics and then he would uh you know he wanted it done a certain way so he would point at you like go like hit it. that's where you hit that so he was like doing a lot of just because i could feel like he wanted it to go in a certain spot. Well, he, him start. and I wrote that song together. I wrote the choruses. Um, he wrote the verses on that song. That was kind of the way a lot of the songs back then went. But um, um, we actually, uh, that's how we worked together. Because his <laughs> timing is like, uh, maybe on a different time. And I mean, like, like, like Fabulous Disaster comes in on a seven, on an eight. You know what I mean? That's weird. You're waiting for that eight count to drop. And it's already a half step. It's already a step, full step behind. So I, I've learned to get my timing with that. And like Steve Esquivel said, you know, like Toxic Waltz, it has a broken up kind of thing where it's not the easiest to do unless you wrote it yourself and know it like well, that, that's, right? I wrote and that. So I wrote I, that one. I, gotcha. so it, I can but always sing what I write, but uh, some songs are more complicated than others. But um, um, by this time, I knew what I wanted in the studio as. Um, you know, as a musician, knowing what sounds you want, what you want in your headphones, what sounds good to you, how you attack it. You know, it was my mm. second record. Uh, um, a lot of I, people don't know, too, is that uh, usually most bands start out with the drums, right? Or, or they do some scratch tracks and then the drummer comes in and they listen to it and they play to it. And then the next thing usually comes is what? Well, the, the, drum, the drums start, obviously. The yeah. drums come with good scratch guitars and then scratch rhythms. I mean, then real rhythm guitars. Then the bass will come and play over the rhythms, and then the leads and the vocals will come and play all all over everything. So the vocals is last. That's always last. Saying. Always. So, last. You got to have something to sing to. You know right. what I mean? So a lot of people just don't because I got asked that question, and they didn't even know what a yes, scratch track was. That's but. that's how it goes. Yeah. So that's how you kind of piece it together. So the album up actually opens up with a guy, and his name is uh, Dove Christopher. They, we called him the Godfather. So the first thing you hear is the prison system. And it was actually taking, the excerpt was taking from the book that Gary uh, read called The Hate Factory. And uh, the first song, Last Act of Defiance, is about the worst prison riot up till that point in, in history. And it was about in New Mexico state prison in 1980 and um, you can google it it's pretty brutal and the things that in the song that happened actually happened these inmates took over it took some hostages oh they guards, they were right? killing they were killing everybody they were killing inmates they were like I remember that. they were like burning them and then they would wake them back up with smelling salts and then burn their genitals i mean they were doing some cruel ass shit very sick stick stuff so the album um, opens up with that. That makes it a good Exodus song, right? Well, it is a good Exodus song. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. It's always twisted, right? Always twisted. And um, to me, that I love that as, as far as an opener goes. That uh, Right. And 
Yeah, that was uh, these songs like that one was a four minute and forty four second song. And also, I'd like to say that this uh, is your biggest charting album up until Blood and Blood Out. Mm-hmm. And but I think it's your biggest selling album to date. I think biggest selling, but I think the highest charting was Blood and Blood Out. Oh, really? Because that did maybe that doesn't take into effect. But yeah, this is and, and this one's still a brutal opener. Last Act of Defiance is still a brutal it debuted opener. at eighty two. On the Billboard Top 200. When it was real, when it was real charting. Those are real numbers. Those were real numbers. And then this album slips into the title track, right? Yeah, one of my favorites on the entire, Fabulous well, everybody's disaster. favorite. And, and I think, you know, and this song is was written, actually, uh, Gary and I wrote this one to, to, together. Um, this is about, you know, at that time there was, you know, the USSR and there was the United States and it was the two world powers at that time. And they both had the power to push the buttons, you know, on each side and blow the whole world up. The cold war. And, and, and and we have nothing to say about it. And to us, that was a fabulous disaster. But the, the title comes from on the uh, pleasures of the flesh tour. We were watching Sid and Nancy and there's a point where Sid, where they're on the boat and they're talking about Sid. And Malcolm McLaren says, "Sydney, he's a fabulous disaster," and that's where we got the got the name for that song. Although I did uh, completely love the name of that. It had nothing to do with the song, mind you. But uh, and here I thought it was about the hotel that went down the side, the side of the hotel <laughs> no, <laughs> being rammed down. Wasn't about that at all. Yeah. And so the next that the, was four fifty four, by the way. So these songs, back then, songs were uh, no, five uh, minutes. They were good. They were good five minutes. Yep. And then uh, now we have the dun, big dun, one. Dun, 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 the one they asked for every period, and that would be toxic waltz. And I basically, I wrote this these words to these songs as a parody. Um, Gary gave me these this music to to go home and listen to and write lyrics to. And I, I asked him, what do you want it to be called? And he goes, we'll call it the Toxic Waltz. Um, and I was like, well, what do you want it to be about? And he goes, well, just make it about what they do at our shows. So you know what I did is I took a 50s dance parody song and kind of broke it down like, uh, you know, a, into an 80s. It was just a joke. When I read the lyrics to him, uh, I was like, you know, you... Uh, this is a Joe. Well, you won't like this. And he read me. He goes, oh, these are brilliant. And look, here we are today. And sometimes just a joke, just like the Stormtroopers of Death releasing a joke album, right. becomes yes. big. You know, that's uh, what the fans love. And it's a perfect capturing the moment of the pit at, a, at an Exodus show. Perfect. It totally. becomes genius. And so from now, that song we play, I think, every single set. And somewhere like the closing... It's in the closing right. three. It's in the closing three, definitely. All right. And then uh, we got song four, which is a cover and a very unusual one to pick once she's ta- telling them about Lowrider. Uh, I don't know why we picked that one to do that. Um, uh, we loved that. The, the, Gary and Rick used to screw around with that guitar part in the... Um, in sound the, checks. In, 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 not like in practice or whatever. Rick's always screwing around like that. So I, I think that's basically where it came from, kind of, as we wanted it to, uh, you know, to just play off that riff. And I, and honestly, I didn't think that song was going to go over that well with the fans, but it totally did. I mean, it totally fucking went over with the fans. And do you remember I got a, a good story about that song? It was like, uh, you played that when we did uh, Iguanas in Tijuana. And do you remember that one over really big? Oh, well, yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> obviously, the Satanico Hispanicos are the yeah. best. They are the best. But yeah, that's a fun. We get that request all the time. We haven't played that in a while. Got to play Low Rider again. And then uh, the song that goes right into that is Cajun Hell, which Cajun is a totally fucking hell. Completely different. the other side of the world. Exactly. We were on tour in... Um, for Pleasures of Flesh, and we stopped by in a really remote uh, uh, restaurant in um, in the bayou. And uh, w- the guys, when we went to eat lunch, there was a band playing behind, you know, the uh, the um, 
you know, at the restaurant playing total Cajun music. And we just like, typical Exodus, we come up with these little stories like, those guys are probably like Cajuns from, you know, and they're like, you know, you don't go around there. It's like, yeah, I bet you if you go on there, you know, they'll chase you down and stuff. And so. And bury you in the swamp. Kind of like a deliverance, uh, Southern Comfort, those two movies that came out about invading the, 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 the Cajun territory. From that came uh, Cajun Hell. And, uh, and what a flair been, that has for what, that southern. Oh man, it the, sounds like you're there. I mean, for the, a metal the guitar, man. the guitar is just uh, really, what? just really perfectly fitted, but just so heavy. The riff is John, 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 John. The headbanger. perfect morphing of fucking the headbanger two, right? right there. One of my favorites to play. That's sure. Rick Unelt at its best, I must say. Yeah, th- I like that. Definitely Rick Unelt at its best. And then, uh, if you had a, a record back then, you'd flip it over. And we'd have uh-huh. like father, like son, which runs eight minutes and eleven long seconds. Long one, which which actually I wrote um about a man who was, you know, abused from his parents or his father in one way or another when he was a child, and now he's actually doing it to his wife and his family. And now the vicious turns and the vicious cycle just continues to uh to keep going and never stop. But how did you fact, get that the, idea? The man, I don't know how I get sick twisted ideas like that. I don't know. It was just one But of that's the, totally true, right? I, like, I guess it, it is. is Socially, it is. It is a very vicious cycle. It was something that I wanted to write about and touch on. So, um, and you know, uh, you know, it was just very real to me. It seemed like you know that this, and it seems like it. it it's it for those people. I lived on a street where a guy who was very abusive to his wife, and later on in life. I saw that he was the same way to his wife and his kids. And it was like almost, I hadn't seen him in a long time. And when I saw him, it was like, ditto. Oh my God. You, and <laughs> like, this is back then. You can't do that stuff nowadays. Oh, no, 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 they no. Put no. You I'm talking in the 70s violence, with his right? mom and dad. And then I saw him with his young family, probably in the late 80s, probably before I wrote this song. And it was like, same thing. Shut up, bitch. Give me a turkey pop line. I was like, Wow. Like father, like son. So basically, that's where that song comes from. And what I like about it in uh, today's world, as right now, 2019, I get it like your sons and you. You can. That's the way I look at it, also, right? Yeah. Well, I they never got but, their asses kicked, and they know, played I'm their own saying, cool metal band and like father, like, like son, son. Your sons. I still, you know, exactly, so exactly. It's, it's mm-hmm. a good. All right, and then we have corruption. Corruption, which I said was explaining earlier, the only one we did have. We were we wrote it because we were told it was going to get onto the soundtrack of Decline of the Western Civilization Part Two, the Metal Years. It didn't happen, and I don't know if it didn't happen because we were st- still on combat because fa- you know Fabulous was on combat, and 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 this was a Capitol record, and even though we were going to Capitol, I think there was a copyright thing they couldn't use the song. I don't know, I don't know why what went down. You never but, know why sometimes, right? It's just but that song is basically. About just corruption in general, religious, political, graft, whatever it is, just corruption. corruption. I think Exodus writes a lot, lot about political uh, ineptitude or I, you know, political bias. realisms. Definitely, must say. All right, then we go, and that, by the way, that was five forty-six, and we go into the next song is Verbal Razors. Well, we had this term: if you you know had to let somebody have it. You know, and give them shit. You verbal razored them to the ground. So, I, heard that, I heard that a lot on the tour. So bus. we verbal razor. Oh, it'd be like, what happened to that guy? Oh, we fucking verbal razored him to the ground. Which we mean, which him. mean we 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 just completely tongue lashed you to death. So if you read the song, the lyrics, the song, I didn't write these at all. This is all Gary Holt completely wrote this. I think him and Rick might have, Rick might have had some lyrical credit on this, but they wrote the whole song. And if you read the lyrics, I'm laughing my ass off singing this one because it's in, now you're digging through the chest looking for a cigarette. Just all kinds of cool, typical kick in your face and rape and murder your wife, tongue and cheek shit from Exodus, you know? And sometimes when you're on the tour bus and this and that, uh, Gary, they like to repeat things, and it's funny for a whole tour, right? Oh, Those yeah, tour exactly. Words, that's the and tour. this is one of them. That's the tour. Yes, Verbal Razor was a tour word, definitely. Definitely hung with us on that. Oh, and then we have uh, the closing track is Open Season. Now, Open another season. one we wrote, and this one is actually taken off a movie that I saw back then, and it was about these three Vietnam veterans who were um, 
kind of still liked the hunt of the kill, the human kill. So now that they were homeside, they would invite these couples to stay at this honeymoon retreat, and then they would hunt them. It's with Peter Fonda. It's like 1974. Really? And 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 they would let them go. And that's why in in the song it says running like a frightened little rabbit would run. They would they would sing run rabbit run rabbit run 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 as they were chasing these people. Wow! But, but of course, there's a twist to the story in that somebody was knew what they were doing and stalking them. So it's the it, reverse. It, 1974 movie. Uh, Peter Fonda called Open Season. Man, typical, what you learn here, man! I didn't even know that. Typical, typical Exodus. Uh, you know, violence and stuff like that. You know, so typical. this is you again writing this, right? I wrote the lyrics to this, yes. And of course, and here you are watching a movie that you love to do, and it influences your songwriting. Exactly, but see, nobody would have known that the song was just about you know these guys who kind of got together once a year, invited these people to go to these retreat, and then ended up hunting them. You know, for sport, you know, so. Well, there's some real serial killers so, that have done that. See, the one in Alaska did. So it was released in, uh, this album came out in um, June 30th of 19, it was 89. In, uh, 89, right? So it's been, what, th- over 30 years now. Yeah. Well, we still have one more song to talk about. Oh, we do? I thought Yeah, we and this is, uh, and we have uh, another song that's still left uh, is a cover. Oh, that's right. If you, oh, if you, and the only way you got it, you couldn't get the song if you, bu- uh, if you bought the album or the cassette. The only way you could get overdose is if you bought the CD. Because at that time, CDs were just brand new and everybody wanted you to buy and the CD. Yeah, they were converting and they were so, a little more expensive back then too. So that um, that uh, that is why you got that. Um, I've always sung like Bon Scott. We were all huge ACDC fans. Well, you know... The reason that you have ACDZ is because I remember you doing this song and how much you sound like him. And I said, man, it would be great to have a... Yeah, and it only took, what, 25 years later? But you're having fun with it, and you are Bon Scott. I am Bon Scott. That's so, right. So, well, that closes the album out, actually. Yeah, but we still have the tours and stuff like that, Well, right? that's what I'm saying. We came out... We first went on tour... I think we started in Europe, actually. We did start in Europe, and we um, used um, Nuclear Assault was on that, and another band called Drifter, and also another band called... Um, Acid Hol- Rain, or not another tour? No, that was another tour. That Hol- was a European tour, though. Holy tour. It says, I need to get Red Rum to turn that uh, fan my way. It says you toured with European with Nuclear Assault and Acid Rain. Do you remember that? Nuclear Assault. Oh, that's right. Acid Rain okay. was on a few of the shows. I think they were just on the... Di- on the, on the uh, the um the english shows because i remember there was like drifter was on that tour a band called drifter from sweden and there was a another band from la called uh, uh holy terror remember holy terror yeah yeah i do um but a lot of these things you know the the bands that are the opener the support might change the different legs of the tour too right so yes on this on back then to actually, Death was supposed to do a leg of this tour. I don't know why they did not. That would have been um, heavy. And then you uh, landed a supporting slot for the Headbangers Ball Headbangers Ball Tour, tour which we've talked about. On, and that went With through Anthrax. A, yeah, and Anthrax Halloween. and Halloween was a lot of fun. And Perry Strickland did the drums Yeah, because on that to, tour. Uh, Tom had stepped out on that tour um, from some health issues, and Perry came in, and that's where we eventually hired John Tempesta as our drummer, and that was on to the next record. Right, he was Anthrax's he drum was Anthrax tech. Anthrax drum tech. We'll he do a whole from, thing on him, right? Oh, we'll do. We'll we'll get him in here. Actually, that's right. Can't run from me, Johnny. Well, you know, I just want to read this. That it was uh, a review said that uh, you went on to uh, this is their most diverse and carefully conceived effort yet, and I think that this is one of your best all around records, and. It is diverse. It has different sounds. You go from, you know, Low Rider and Cajun Hell, and you have Fabulous Disaster, which well, is. Well, so I'm saying it has good hills best. and valleys on it, I That's think. That's right. And it has a good blend of different uh, tempos, good blend of uh, different musical influences. And, you know, I know that if you were counting record sales, that this is the one. You know, you might have gone gold on. They just don't tell you. It was close. Money, right? I, I think it did go gold. They just didn't want to tell us that. And that happens a lot. I know that Testament's record like that is practice what you preach. preach. They think that, you know, it probably went gold or it's as close as it is. It could still. And, you know, in this new world we have, it, you could still go gold on it. 
in the future. Depending. If they count. But the thing is, is if they if you go gold, they got to pay you for gold, and nobody wants to pay you for gold. <laughs> Just the industry standard. That's right. But, you know, such is life. After that, we did a headlining tour after Headbangers Bar. We went out with Forbidden through the States. I remember that's where I was on a little part of that tour. And th- that was a great bill. That was a real fun tour for the, for you, too. Yeah, and then um, I remember it ending up at the Fillmore in uh, San Francisco for Bastille and Day. And that was a big... Yes. Was it a, Bastille Day was, is the Warfield. No, Bastille Day was, 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 the, was the Fillmore. Mm-hmm. I don't know, I got the poster. Well, the poster was made for the Fillmore because they make the Fillmore posters. Okay. Hence the poster. I got it. Yeah, it was Bastille The Warfield Day, was the um was the uh skull on the plate with MOD with the head thing and says so Excess and MOD. That's right. That was the That's that was the word. Right. That's right. And Bastille Day. Well, come on. Come well, on. You know. Tell, uh, tell him. Tell we him. You know Mom. who's got a better rank. Wait a minute, you didn't buzz in. Tell me, I didn't have my thing here. You don't want to get your ass kicked again, yeah, do you? But that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember, I have that poster too, the Bastille Day, and it shows all the. the Which end of the tour? And we didn't go to Europe for that one. I don't know why we didn't. I mean, again, we, we did You're go. under that pressure from Well, well we, capital, we went right? from the, what well, we did, well, the thing was, is we had went, you know, we opened the tour in Europe. I, we didn't go again. Usually, we usually go two, three times, you know, on that. We didn't go again on that. And, and we were. We had just going into Capital, and they wanted their album, so we started writing impact is imminent and that's kind of how that went so with if you're on a timeline from us with from bonded by blood then that's kind of how it's kind of all that time there wasn't really much time off and then we were working constantly and so. uh, i'd like to say about this album cover gene ambo shot it and we have a whole episode on that so if you missed that you can go back and see the making of that album cover which is to me very interesting and very different Great album cover. Great album. Great album. 1989. One of my favorites. Was one of my favorite years. Every tour was so much fun. I've always been said. I've always said, if there was a year I could go back in time to, it would have been 1989. I had a really. I had so much fun on tour, and the band was doing so well, and everything was great. So that's what I got for this one. You got anything else for that, Walt? Just that this is the cover of the silver edition. Which is doubt, which you can get. I don't. Maybe. Yeah, it's uh, European, I think, and uh, it's hard to get actually because I have a. I have one. Yeah, and it's got a poster inside of Fabulous yeah. Disaster, and it's got that. It's bonus just a track. cool looking, cool looking. Oh, thing, it's so. cool in the slip sleeve. So anyway. if you're wondering about that, look on eBay, but it comes up rarely. Anyway, remember to share this and uh, leave me comments. Leave obviously. some comments about. What yeah, we want to know what you thought because you know I always see a lot of comments talking about oh man fabulous i remember when you guys came through and stuff like that so leave me your comments and your stories you know we'll talk about it during viewer comments and stuff and obviously subscribe to the channel and shit meanwhile well i guess next one up when we can do this will be impact is imminent that's right we got a lot to say time. about that yep we do so i know a lot of people want us to talk about that and force and we will get to that so like i said just subscribe to my channel Leave the comments. Keep sharing this stuff. And and watch it on your TV. Exactly. Exactly. And while you're watching on TV, drink goddamn Death Wish coffee. That's what I we drink. Right That's now, why now. we're sweating our asses off in here. Not because <laughs> like we do 90. crank. We don't do crank anymore. We just drink Death Wish coffee. So anyway, you guys, we'll see you soon in the vault. Later.